On one sunny afternoon in the U.S., Bernard Arnault asked his taxi driver what he loved about France. The driver's answer took him completely off guard. This pivotal moment laid the foundations of Bernard's now $400 billion empire. This is the insane story of the man known as the Wolf in Kashmir, the godfather of luxury, and the architect of countless billion-dollar takeovers, an unstoppable force who built LVMH, the luxury behemoth, out of nothing. Chapter 1. The Beginning Bernard Arnault was born on March 5, 1949, in Roubaix near the Belgian border. His father owned an engineering firm, Ferré Savinal. Bernard was incredibly smart and graduated from France's leading engineering school, École Polytechnique, in 1971. Just as expected, after his graduation, he started working at his father's company. However, Bernard's father made him join the company as a junior worker and a constructor. He wanted Bernard to learn the ropes, persevere, and earn his place in the company. And Bernard was no slacker. He worked harder than any other worker in the company. But one thing made him stand out completely. He always had great ideas to take the company to a whole new level and would leave everyone in the room mesmerized with his brilliance. As he went up the ladder, nobody could question his rise as he truly deserved it. Then, three years after working at his father's company, he made a shocking suggestion that took everyone by surprise. Ferre Savinel was thriving, but Bernard knew they could be even bigger. The real estate industry was booming, and he knew it was the ideal opportunity for them to get involved. So he told his father to sell part of the company and enter real estate instead. His father was extremely skeptical of Bernard's idea, but when Bernard showed him the numbers, he realized how incredibly shrewd his idea was and gave his blessing. The industrial construction division of Ferre Savinel was sold and a new company, Ferrenel, was launched. It wasn't a surprise that Bernard got named the CEO as he truly deserved it. On the personal front, he married Anne de Wavrin in 1973, and in the next four years, they had a daughter, Delphine, and a son named Antoine. Just as he predicted, the real estate business started growing rapidly, and his father could not be more proud. But in 1981, he had to move his whole family to the U.S. due to the rise of French socialists who were hell-bent on exploiting the wealthy, and Bernard was not having it. And so he moved to the U.S. while also smartly using that opportunity to expand the business to America. Little did he know that a chance encounter was going to change his destiny forever. Chapter 2. The Pivot the U.S. was good to Bernard as Farinelle was growing by the minute. He enjoyed being in the States, but little things reminded him of France and he constantly longed to go back. However, it was still not convenient for him to go back. One day, he boarded a taxi. His French accent was quite evident, so when he spoke, the driver could tell he was French. As soon as the driver heard the accent, he began gushing about how much he loved France. Bernard was pleased to hear that and engaged the man in a conversation. He asked him why he loved France and who the president was. Surprisingly, the taxi driver had no idea who the French president was, but then he inexplicably mentioned Dior as one of the reasons he loved France. This conversation might seem like just a regular casual conversation to you, but that very moment played a pivotal role in Bernard's future. It amazed him that a brand would have more recall than the president himself, and he couldn't stop thinking about what it meant. Before the incident, he had already been thinking about how successful luxury brands were and what it would be like to own one. The fact that his mother was also in love with luxury brands, especially Dior, made him know about them from a tender age. At that moment, he pushed back the thought and focused on his engineering company. But just a while later, an opportunity came knocking at his door that was too good to resist. Chapter 3. First Steps in 1983, Bernard and his family returned to France. Everything had settled down, and they could return to living a comfortable life without horrendous tax rates. One day, while he was going about his regular business, he came across shocking news. The Boussac saint frere Empire, the textile conglomerate which owned Christian Dior, was put on the block in a fire sale. The Boussac Empire had gone bankrupt, and since it was somewhat of a landmark in France, the French government under then-President Mitterrand needed someone to save the company. 
Bernard wanted to own Dior badly, but the brand could not be separated from the conglomerate, so he knew he had to be the one to step in to save the conglomerate. Mind you, at the time, he was just a CEO of a branch of his father's company. He was wealthy, but not enough to acquire the whole empire on his own, so he asked for help. And who better to ask for help than the legendary French banker Antoine Bernheim? At the time, Antoine was a senior partner at Lazard Frere. When Bernard told him his plight, he advised him on what to do and ensured the bank loaned him $80 million. With the $80 million obtained from the bank, he only had to take $15 million from his family and was able to acquire the business, renaming it Financière Agache. That very moment was the beginning of far greater things to come for Bernard, but he didn't know about it just yet. From that day forward, he wasn't just a family businessman, but a prestigious luxury brand owner. At the time, the Boussac empire included the department store Le Bon Marche, the retail shop Conforama, the nappy manufacturer Poduce, and of course, Christian Dior. However, every business in the empire was crumbling, and he wasn't in a position to save them all. So he had to make a tough but brutal decision to keep the brands he actually wanted afloat. In two years, he laid off 9,000 workers and sold off all of the company's assets except Dior and Le Bon Marche. That single move earned him the nickname Terminator and made him detested by many. Bernard had held on to Le Bon Marche because it was already a well-known store and had a great history spanning over a century. His reason behind retaining Dior might already be evident to you. At the time, some said he should have done things differently and tried to save all the businesses, but he did what he did and it yielded staggering results. By 1987, the company was profitable again and recorded earnings of $112 million on a revenue of $1.9 billion. It's said that fortune favors the brave, and so it happened that another once-in-a-lifetime opportunity of epic proportions was just knocking on his door, and Bernard knew he just had to go for it. Chapter 4. LVMH Being a luxury brand owner, you would also become acquainted with other luxury tycoons and would most likely become friends. And that was how Alain Chevalier, then CEO of Moet Hennessy, Henri Recamier, the then CEO of Louis Vuitton, and Bernard Arnault met. It all started with Alain Chevalier. Chevalier was leading the spirits and wine brand Moet Hennessy at the time. The business was quite profitable, but there was a problem. It was quite exposed to a hostile takeover. A hostile takeover was a major fear for several public liability companies as someone could secretly buy a major share of your company and try to take over. For several months, Alon had noticed that someone was mysteriously buying a lot of shares of Moet Hennessy, which meant only one thing hostile takeover. As he could not watch his company being taken away right under his nose, he reached out to Louis Vuitton. At the time, Louis Vuitton was under the control of Henry Recamier. Henry had gotten to be in charge by marrying the great-granddaughter of Louis Vuitton himself. He had taken the brand to a new level through international expansion and scaled it to a billion dollars in sales by 1987. Alain knew that a merger between Moet Hennessy and Louis Vuitton would give his company a stronger footing and prevent the possibility possibility of a hostile takeover. In 1987, the merger was successful and they both couldn't wait for the combined entity they named LVMH, Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, to achieve even greater heights. Just a few weeks later, however, there was trouble in LVMH paradise. Alain felt that Henry was dictating his own decisions about Louis Vuitton and would treat him like he didn't exist. He even downplayed the products of Moet Hennessy by claiming the product could be found anywhere while Louis Vuitton had to be acquired at exclusive stores. But there was an even bigger problem. The structure of LVMH was made so that outsiders couldn't take over the company, but Alain noticed that someone within the company was buying the shares and all fingers pointed at Henry. Henry. Alain knew if Henry took over, he would be tossed to the sidelines. He made a desperate move, reaching out to an old friend, Sir Anthony Tennant of Guinness, which acquired a 20% stake in LVMH. With this, Alain was able to show Henry that he wasn't going to be a pushover in this game of chess. Henry saw Alain's move and decided to reach out to Bernard Arnault. He was impressed by Bernard's achievements and saw him more as a protege than a rival. He told him what was going on at the company and Bernard 
Bernard was eager to help. But just like his partnership with Alain, Henry's partnership with Bernard didn't go as planned. In fact, it led to one of the biggest feuds in the French, scratch that, global fashion industry. Chapter 5. The Feud Everything started falling through when Recamier decided to tell Alain of his plan to allow Bernard to acquire some shares. Alain knew what it meant, so he told Henry to give him time to think, which Henry agreed to out of courtesy. This angered Bernard because he believed Henry was stalling, and he proceeded to vent about it to his mentor and friend Antoine Bernheim. This is when everything became crystal clear to him. He found out about the power tussle happening at LVMH and that he was about to be dragged into the middle of it. Since Lazard Ferrer, the company Antoine worked for, was on Alain's side, he mentioned to Bernard that if he was going to pick a side, he should pick theirs instead. Since Guinness was also involved, Bernard got convinced. Henry soon found out that the person he had called for support had backstabbed him. But then it was quite too late as Bernard had formed a holding company with Guinness, which had a 24% stake in LVMH. With Henry still resisting, Bernard went in for the killing blow by spending a whopping $1.1 billion to gain a total of 43.5% of LVMH's shares and 35% of its voting rights by January 1989. Knowing that Henry, then chairman of the board at LVMH, would do all in his capacity to ensure that nothing went his way, he knew the best thing to do was strip him of his power. And so, in a contest that earned him the title of the Young Wolf, he ousted Henry with his voting rights and with the backing of the other members of the board. Unsurprisingly, he was named chairman of the executive management board of LVMH on the 13th of January, 1989. And that was the beginning of a new dawn for this group group of luxury brands. Chapter 6. Wolf in Kashmir Bernard had not taken over the company without a strategy. He wanted to transform LVMH into one of the largest luxury groups in the world and immediately set out to achieve that goal. He aimed to acquire the most admired luxury brands and make them a part of the LVMH group. After acquiring them, he intended to make the products more attractive to customers by following new trends or even creating new trends. Before he became the chairman, he had acquired the brand Celine. That same year, he also tried to launch a luxury clothing line spearheaded by French fashion designer Christian Lacroix. That didn't go well as they later had to close production in 2009. Besides the thing with Christian Lacroix, LVMH was thriving under Bernard's rule. But things were not going as well at home because in 1990, he and Anne de Wavrin got divorced. The reason behind their divorce was not revealed, but there were speculations that Bernard fell in love with another woman in 1989, and that hurt their marriage greatly. It might not exactly be far from the truth, as the year right after their divorce, in 1991, he got married to a Canadian concert pianist, Helene Mercier. He and Helene now have three children together, Alexander, Frederick, and Jean. Despite the drama at home with the divorce and the new marriage, Arnaud ensured none of it impacted his work. He spent hours each day researching several luxury brands and analyzing if it was a smart move to acquire them. In 1992, the first Louis Vuitton store opened in China. There were challenges opening up a new store on a whole new continent, but it has since become an incredible success. In 93, he acquired Berluti, a prestigious malware manufacturer then Kenzo, another luxury fashion house. He interestingly bought a French newspaper, La Tribune, in the same year, but later sold it in 2007 to acquire another newspaper. Over the next few years, the group acquired Guerlain, Lowe, Marc Jacobs, Sephora, Fendi, the watchmakers Chaumet, Zenith, and Tag Heuer. In 98, Bernard personally purchased Chateau Cheval Blanc, a wine producer, but LVMH later purchased it from him. In 99, something peculiar happened. Whenever Bernard laid his focus on a particular brand, he did everything within his means to ensure that he got the brand. Some may have been easy because they intended to sell, but for some, he had to pull some tricks out of his sleeve to be able to take over. And these ruthless tactics earned him the nickname Wolf in Kashmir. A perfect example of his tactics was what happened with Gucci in 1999. 
Bernard wanted Gucci and secretly started buying shares in an attempt to take over. Unlucky for him, the then Gucci executives noticed. Tom Ford and Domenico De Sol, who were in control of Gucci, fought against it. But Bernard tried to convince them he was just trying to be supportive. To prove his point, he increased the stake to 34.4%, but that made them even more uncomfortable. So, De Sol proposed that in return for board representation, Bernard should stop buying more stake in the company. But Bernard rejected these terms. De Sol soon found a way to stop Bernard, and in the end, LVMH was unable to acquire Gucci. Something similar happened with Hermes, but we'll get to that. Although 1999 was filled with highs and lows, Bernard got named the richest person in fashion due to how insanely profitable LVMH had become. However, Bernard was about to stumble into a whole host of controversies, which promised to derail his fairy tale rise. Chapter 7 Controversies In 2010, Hermes occurred. Bernard had tried to take over the maker of the famous Birkin handbags and silk scarves, just like he had tried with Gucci. He started buying the shares in 2001, but nobody found out till 2010, when he had already acquired 17.1% of the company. With Bernard's reputation preceding him, Hermes management knew what he intended and seriously protested it. Bernard eventually failed and decided to distribute the shares he had accumulated and agreed not to try to take over the company. Although it has been greatly summarized, the feud between the two companies lasted almost a decade. Being wealthy makes you constantly in the public eye, and people are quick to make speculations about any step you take. This is exactly what happened to Bernard in 2013. He had applied for Belgian citizenship, and controversies quickly arose about him applying for citizenship because he wanted to evade French taxes. This overwhelming scandal forced him to withdraw the application. He later explained that the reason behind his application was that he wanted to widen his business horizon, but nobody believed him. While discussing controversies, it's important to mention the incident with Tiffany's. Most likely due to Bernard's reputation, many people were quick to put LVMH to blame when it decided that it was no longer interested in acquiring Tiffany's in 2020. They had shown interest in 2019, and the brand was excited to become a part of LVMH. But in 2020, Bernard said Tiffany's was mismanaging funds and was on the brink of collapsing, so he was no longer interested in acquiring the brand. Tiffany felt slighted and immediately took legal action. When things looked like it wouldn't go in its favor, LVMH finally acquired Tiffany's. Despite all the hiccups that LVMH faced while acquiring brands, it was able to acquire notable brands like Bulgari and even open new brands like Fenty with Rihanna, among several others. With all these acquisitions, soon the empire became the largest in the Eurozone, with a jaw-dropping market cap of over $400 billion today. And on the 5th of August, 2021, Bernard Arnault became the richest man in the world with a net worth of almost $200 billion. Chapter 8. The Man, Bernard Arnault Unlike some of his wealthy contemporaries, Bernard keeps a very low profile. He is only fierce when it comes to business. There was a time when he revealed that he sold off his private jet due to negative comments about him on Twitter. He enjoys acquiring art and has an incredible art collection. In fact, in 2014, LVMH launched the Louis Vuitton Foundation, which is purely dedicated to the creation of contemporary art and support of upcoming artists. Unfortunately, both Bernard and LVMH are not really known for giving back to society. Besides the Foundation for Art and a one-time donation of $216 million to Notre Dame Cathedral when it caught fire, there is barely anything about his philanthropic exploits. It could also be that he likes to keep it quiet and on the down low. As regards his five children, Bernard trained them just like his father by making them work their way to the top. It was revealed that Delphine, the soon-to-be CEO of Dior, once worked as a sales girl at the Paris Dior boutique. Her brothers also have reputable roles in the company. Antoine is the vice chairman and CEO of Christian Dior SE. Alexander is the EVP of Tiffany & Co. Frederick is the CEO of Tag Heuer. And Jean is the director of marketing and development at Louis Vuitton. At the age of 73, Bernard is still unstoppable, and only time will tell what more he would be able to achieve. Which items from Bernard's collection of brands are on your bucket list to buy? Do you own one already? Let us know in the comments section.